again what a uh, tremendous privilege and honor it is to be able to break the bread of life to the body of Christ. Uh, this is somewhat of a frightening thing if you've been up here. If you haven't even talked to people, it's not easy always to stand up here. I, I wish I could preach like Pastor David or Ken Johnson. They they can come up here and talk for 50 minutes with a three by five card and never even <laughs> flip it over on the back side. And I've got 20 some pages here that I've got to go through. But my prayer is that what I've written out for you uh, will bring edification, exhortation, and comfort to you today. An old song goes like this, how very rich I am since Jesus came my way. He turned my, he redeemed my soul and turned my night to day. How very rich, how very rich I am. Of all people, we are the wealthiest. We are the richest. Those redeemed, ransomed, blood washed and sanctified, we're part of the body of Christ. We are the richest. David said in Psalm 149, the Lord takes delight in his people. He grants salvation to the humble. Let the saints rejoice in this honor. Rejoice in this honor and sing for joy in their beds. John said, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed or lavished on us that we should be called his children. How honored and rich we are to possess his salvation and to be called his children. Amen. I hadn't at first realized I'd be speaking on Mother's Day, and sadly, I don't have a Mother's Day message for you. In fact, I thought about scuttling this message, but it was a little bit too late. But I deliberately wore my pink jacket today in honor for you moms and second, to maybe take the edge off of this uh, serious message. And how serious can you take a guy wearing a pink coat, right? I mean. But unlike some people, I'm not confused. I can tell you the definition of a woman. <laughs> a woman is an adult female human being that has a distinctly feminine nature who alone is capable of conceiving, sustaining, and birthing another human being in their body. Amazing. They can be a sister, a niece, a friend, a wife, a mother, an aunt, a grandmother. They're honest, trustworthy, intelligent, supportive, nurturing, strong, compassionate, and forgiving. I like what Maurice Chevalier said in the song once, thank heaven for little girls. For little girls get bigger every day. Thank heaven for little girls. They grow up in the most delightful way. Thank God for women. And every normal red-blooded man in here and online, can you say a hearty amen? amen? Thank you, mothers, for all you do for us. You're a gift from God. Mark Twain was asked, what would men be without women? His reply, Scarce, very scarce. <laughs> well, my intent today in this message is to hopefully bring some biblical clarity to two areas, often a source of misinterpretation. Those areas are suffering and sovereignty. I've got a load of scripture and subject matter to cover in a short time, and I'm going to have to move really fast. So. Grab onto my pink coattails and let's go. We've all grown up through different periods uh, of time, uh, listening to different voices, and from them we come up with our own opinions and beliefs. Many of them are true, but many of them are mistaken beliefs, false, consumption, false assumptions, and misconceptions. As children, some of these ideas were caught and others were taught. Many of us assume that, uh, and for good reason, that there was a Santa. And that storks dropped off babies like they did in the Dumbo movie. 
As little boys, we believed girls had cooties. Then we got a little older, and that myth dissolved in a big hurry. Some of us believed if you swallowed a watermelon seed that it would grow in your tummy. And did you get this impression from your parents that turning on the dome light in your car, in your car while driving was somehow illegal? And how many of our moms convinced us that the bread crust had all the vitamins in it? We thought sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite was just like a bedtime saying. Then we went to family camp two years ago. <laughs> Just joking. We should have a great turnout August 6th through the 10th. Be there. And don't let the bed bugs bite. <clears throat> and I'm sure there's not a person in here or online that wasn't convinced there was a monster in your basement, in your closet, and for sure under your bed. And that somehow covers could really protect you from it. What misconceptions. Our English language doesn't help either. A dandelion is not a lion, it's a flower. A cauliflower is not a flower, it's a vegetable. A jellyfish isn't a fish, it's a squid. A peanut is not a nut, it's a bean. And a funny bone is not a bone, it's a nerve. As we graduated into the working force, it didn't take long to find that old saying to be true. Variety is the spice of life but it's monotony that brings home the bacon. <laughs> then there's marriage. We enter it with a set of ideals and a lot of expectations that our spouse is hopefully going to meet. Things like our relationship will continue to be like our first months of marriage. We'll always be kind and polite to one another and be close with our in-laws. If my spouse really loves me, they'll know what my needs are and meet them when in fact, marriage is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. Many of these misconceptions most often just fizzle out under the weight of reality and time, and usually with minimal consequences. But when it comes to what one believes spiritually, misconceptions can have a lasting consequence and even affect one's destiny. And in our culture, there's no shortage of convincing voices. The Buddhists say, if you want to know the truth, you go this way. The Hindus say, no, you want to know the truth, you go this way. The Sikhs say, this is the way, the truth. Judaism says, no, this is the way, the Torah. You've got Joseph Smith and the Mormons say, no, this is the way to go. Uh, Taze Russell and the Jehovah Witnesses say, no, this is the way. And then you have even Star Wars characters like the Mandalorian say, this is the way. <laughs> and then Jesus steps on, and, on the scene and says, I am. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the only leader of faith that confirmed this title and this truth by fulfilled prophecy, supernatural signs and wonders, and his bodily resurrection from the dead. The Jewish nation, the very people through which the Messiah came, missed out on their day of visitation because of their misconception. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. We may need to change our strongly held opinions if they're not aligned with God's word. So with that as introduction, Let's focus on these two areas of concern, suffering and sovereignty. Some of our greatest fears as human beings are uncertainty and insecurity. And for that reason, we tend to like gather things around us to help make us feel more secure. We invest in gold and silver, stocks and bonds, home properties, land, to hopefully sustain us through the latter years of uncertainty. We're being offered survival foods more and more today because we're not sure about future food supplies. Gun and ammo sales have dramatically increased because we're not certain how long our Second Amendment's going to stand, and for concern of our own safety as well. These unknowns can cause distress. Webster defines suffering as the state of undergoing pain, distress, or hardship. 
and sovereignty, supreme power and authority. In case you weren't aware of it, the number one reason most people choose to disobey or disbelieve in God or even turn from their once held faith is over these two issues. So if God is in control, he's all powerful, all loving, all knowing, knows when even one sparrow falls to the ground, why would he allow all of this suffering and injustice we see? And if you and I are sincerely honest, we ourselves as Christians, we've asked the same question. Why the suffering? Why the bad things? Why do bad things happen if God is sovereign and oversees the course of human history? Why the pain? And how does God's sovereignty and man's free will play out in the scheme of things? These are worthy questions that deserve a worthy answer. The facts are evident, though. Suffering is evil, and suffering and evil are all around us. Natural disasters, hurricanes, forest fires, floods, tsunamis, earthquakes, tornadoes bring major human suffering. What's most disturbing is the moral suffering we see. A father takes a handgun and kills his family and then himself. A mother drowns her five children. The verbal and physical abuse going on in our homes today. Drug, opioid, now marijuana addiction running rampant in our communities. Access to the most pornographic visuals, nothing left to the imagination. Governmental corruption throughout many of our federal and state agencies along with voter fraud. Children enticed and abducted into sex trafficking. Jesus said, you might as well Go to Home Depot, get yourself about three or four cinder blocks and about 20 foot of rope. Tie them around those blocks and around your neck tightly and throw them over the Mackinac Bridge if you offend one of these little ones in that way. But sadly, suffering doesn't stop at the church doors. A young girl goes on her first ever date. A Class A felony is committed and she has a child. Christian father is severed in half by large sheets of steel when he's pinned against a wall at work. A mother with three children after grocery shopping is abducted. She never emotionally recovers. A fine teenage boy with strong biblical foundation at 18 had his head severed from his body at his place of employment. A star Christian high school soccer player dies in his sleep just before graduation. A family man in his late 30s and a passionate witness to the lost stayed at home from church one Sunday and took his life. Our diaper service man, they called them diety services back then. Um, he was missing for about six weeks. He took off. And when he finally came back, we, we said, Jim, what did what, you do? You go on vacation or something? He stood in our kitchen and just cried. The tears ran down his cheeks onto his shirt. When he finally got his composure, he said, our little three-year-old daughter climbed into a stroller. It collapsed and uh, cut off her oxygen and she died in the stroller. All these believers I personally knew. I just heard of a father who for a split second reached to get a diaper in his Infant child fell off the changing table, broke its neck, and died. A man attends an evangelical church for a few weeks, and a month later in the service kills the pastor, six others, and wounds four more before killing himself. The worldwide persecution and suffering of fellow Christian brothers and sisters is most troubling. I saw a disturbing clip of three Christians in a Muslim, in a, uh, Muslim country. They were thrown into a ditch with kerosene put on them, lit on fire, and as they were trying to squelch those burning flames all over their bodies, that they were beating them with long rods. I wept, I had to turn it off. I apologize for having to deliver such a serious subject on a special day like this, forgive me. But evil, pain, and suffering do exist. Without raising your hand or making a comment, Mentally answer this question. 
Did God have a part in the previous tragedies I just mentioned? Hopefully by the end of this message, we'll have a clear understanding. The question of suffering and sovereignty have been an enigma and a paradox for ages. Writers throughout scriptures have expressed their feelings and frustration as well. David in Psalm 10, why, O Lord, do you stand off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his ignorance, wicked men hunt down the weak who are caught in the schemes they devise. Asaph mirrors that same disappointment almost to the point of resentment in Psalm 73. And in the end, when I tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. People ask, could not have God come up with a better plan that was void of suffering where there's good and no evil? We know in the beginning God created the world and it was good, without evil and suffering or death. His ultimate creation was man and woman and he placed them in the beautiful garden. And it was there when it all started, when they both deliberately chose to introduce another will into the universe, their will above the Creator's will. How could this happen? The answer, free will. You see, God knew that if He created a world where human beings had free will and could exercise more good than evil in that world, that it would be more valuable than a world containing creatures with no free will. Now, God can create free creatures, but He can't program them only to do what's right, for then they would not be free. Also, because of God's love, He wanted to create creatures who could only who also freely love him and each other. Real love has to have real choice. Sadly, some of those free creatures chose to exercise their freedoms wrongly, and this is the reason we have moral uh, evil. In reality, a world without choice, without free will, would be hell. Rightly said, God is responsible for the fact of freedom. Man is responsible for the act of freedom. So the answer to the question, why didn't God just make a world without suffering, uh, evil and suffering? Well, the answer is, He did. He made a good world, and we broke it. Listen to the late S.M. Lockridge. Where did God come from? He came from nowhere because there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. And from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he stood on nothing was because there was nowhere for him to stand. And standing on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach and caught something where there was nothing to catch and hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. And standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will and struck the anvil of his omnipotence and sparks flew therefrom, and he caught them on the tips of his fingers and flung them out into space and bedecked the heavens with stars. And nobody said a word. The reason nobody said a word, there wasn't nobody there to say a word. So God himself said, that's good. He created the heavens and the earth, and it was to he was in total control. He then created man and woman and gave them permission to be fruitful, fill, subdue, and rule over the earth. He gave them control. But by their willful disobedience, they forfeited that control. And who did it go to? 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are children of God and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Control and rulership switched hands. Luke 5 says, The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Jesus never challenged him. Why? Because it was true. If this world today were under God's ultimate control, should we not see that manifested all around us? 
But instead, most of what we see in our world appears to be happening just like it should. If men, good and evil, were allowed to have free will. And it would appear from the actions we see that someone other than a just and righteous ruler is in control of this world. 2 Corinthians 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Why? Because he can. John 12. Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. Why? Because a prince has power. Ephesians 2. He's called the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Rulers have control and authority. Hebrews 2, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. 1 Corinthians 15, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, or authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Again, 1 John 5, 19, we know that. We know that we are children of God, amen? And the whole world, though, is under the control of the evil one. I'm aware that for some, this might be a little uncomfortable this morning. It may be disturbing your paradigm. We've grown up in the church using phrases like, God knows best. Nothing happens apart from God's will. This is an act of God. No such thing as an accident. God allowed it. God is sovereign. God is in control. An exposure to this passage we just read in the previous passages may challenge our long-held beliefs of sovereignty. And when unexplainable suffering or tragedy does come, we have a tendency to want to file it under the God is in control folder. We think that for God to be sovereign, God to be God, he has to be in absolute control. But we're encouraged to rightly divide the word of truth. Jesus says, you're deceived because you don't know the scriptures and the power of God. He said in Luke 16, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. I'm just trusting God in this situation. He's in control. And a week later, you're in ICU with your left side paralyzed because you were too stubborn to go to the doctor. I'm sorry, but I've been guilty of this myself, but sometimes us Christians get a little kooky. Do you know what I mean? We tend to over-spiritualize and often bypass the rational and logical common sense solutions for fear of showing doubt or possibly a lack of faith. Am I making any sense? It's clear from those prior verses that God has enemies, enemies who still defy him and resist him, which lets us know that he is not yet in total control. But there's coming a time, it's soon to come, when God will take back that control through Christ David said, Psalm 37, a little while the wicked will no, be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found, but the meek will inherit the earth and enjoy peace and prosperity. Paul in 2 Thessalonians lets us know when this righteous judgment will take place. In verse 5 he said, as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just, he will pay back trouble to those who have troubled you and give relief to you who are troubled to, and to us as well. And verse 7, this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will have the last word. Suffering will end and justice will reign, but not yet. It's certainly true God is universally, by his very nature as creator, the ultimate uh, orchestrator of his creation. His word will not return to him void, and the book of Revelation will be fulfilled. 
And regardless of what forms of suffering come our way in this temporal life, our citizenship, our allegiance, our focus, our future hope is in that which is eternal, no question about it. We're pilgrims, strangers, aliens, nomads, gypsies, if you please, in this world. And if we continue in the faith, we have an inheritance reserved in heaven for us, not here. But in the end, we must align our opinions with God's word and not the other way around. Look with me at how Jesus responds to this human suffering in this, in this passage. Luke 13. Now there was some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their suffering. Stop there a minute. Pilate found some worshipers at the Temple Mount and had them slaughtered and had their blood mixed with their sacrifices that they were giving to the Lord. Continue. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. So we have a tragic massacre and a collapse of a tower killing 18 people. Jesus' response gives us some insight. He warns his listeners not to assign guilt to victims and assume unexplainable events as the judgment or vengeance of God. Divine intervention or an act of God had nothing to do with these mishaps. A free will choice was made by an evil ruler, and those that perished, perished, unfortunately, were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The architects of a tower just outside of Jerusalem failed in their design along the way, and it collapsed on 18 people and crushed them to death. So Jesus was basically saying, look, every one of you in one way or another will someday perish. You live in a real world, and because of sin, has made suffering and death inevitable. You never know what a day will bring, what life will hand you. Some will perish like these who had no part in that choice of death. But listen, every one of you has a free will choice not to perish eternally. So make that choice to repent. It's obvious then we need to get one thing settled straight off the bat. Suffering is here to stay. It's part and parcel of life on earth. Adam brought this on every single one of us because of his disobedience with no exceptions. Maybe we could use a little humor right now. So since we're talking about good news and bad news, the doctor calls this patient. He says, John, I've got some, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. All right, Doc, what is it? Well, the good news is you've got 24 hours to live. What? what? What's the bad news? I forgot to call you yesterday. <laughs> we laugh at that, but life is full of good news and bad news. You know that. You're either in trouble, you're on your way to trouble, or you're going to be in trouble just coming out of it. There's an old saying, the older I get, the better I was. And it's, it's true. See, suffering knows your address. It knows your zip code. It knows your social security number, your bank account, your routing number. Suffering knows your phone number, your email, all your passwords. You can't escape it. Suffering is privy to every detail of your life. The good news is, so is God. And he will graciously and miraculously use that suffering for our enhancement and his glory. Jesus said in John 16, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. My paraphrase, this world with all its sin, evil, pain, suffering, and sorrow can't squelch can't vanquish, can't rob you of the joy, hope, love, and peace you have in the Holy Ghost. So be encouraged. 
Like a beach ball underwater, his joy can't be held down for long. Let's see what instruction we get from Scripture. Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, or suffering long. Paul in Philippians 3 states that he's suffered the loss of all things and that he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. 2 Timothy 2, we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. Hebrews 5, though he was a son, Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. 1 Peter 4, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Philippians 3 reminds us that we can't be conformed to his image until we share in his sufferings. Philippians 1, for it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. 1 Peter 5, and the God of all grace, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Romans 8, now if we are children, then heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. And then the next verse, for I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed in us. It's been said, human interruption is divine instruction. And for the child of God, this is certainly true. Every so-called negative in interruption, whatever it may be, is a springboard to greater maturity in Christ. Peter gives us what may be the clearest biblical perspective of Christian suffering we can find in Scripture. 1 Peter 1, 6-8. If there's a passage you should memorize, it should be this and have your children memorize it. In this you greatly rejoice, this is referring to Christ's return, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He's refining our faith producing praise, glory, and honor to the very thing that we may despise the most, the cauldron of suffering. God can make use of what he hates to accomplish what he loves. Suffering touches us both physically and mentally. Physically, we have the pain, accidents, sickness, disease, natural disasters, even martyrdom. Mental suffering, you've got sorrow, rejection, fear, persecution, grief, worry, isolation, loneliness, to name a few. But just as God uses used the worst suffering in the world, the cross, to produce the greatest good, man's salvation, he also uses our suffering to accomplish a greater good, spiritual maturity. Listen to Romans 5, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces a perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. James said in the first chapter, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Paul knew something about suffering and talks about it in 2 Corinthians 12. Listen to him in verse 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Suffering is actually redemptive in God's hands. It helps discipline us. It leads us to repentance and purges sin from our lives. David never repeated what he did with Bathsheba. How many of you came to the Lord through suffering? Or, or because of suffering have grown spiritually? I call that redemptive. 
It makes us more sensitive, more thankful, increases our faith, unites us with other believers, makes us more dependent on Him. Suffering and trials reveal our insufficiency, our humanity, our mortality, which James says is like a vapor, it's like a mist. God's not obligated to alter the laws of physics and take away your pain and suffering. But God enters into our suffering with us and actually transforms and redeems that suffering so that now it has a new meaning. You can ask Johnny Erickson Tata about that. If you think God can't direct any evil to a good end, look at the cross. Listen to Paul's final mountaintop perspective. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I asked you earlier to make a mental judgment on whether the sufferings of those mentioned previously were by God's design. It's crucial that I briefly interject something at this point. Some people have had their faith shaken. They can understand how tragedies can happen to the unbeliever, to the ungodly, but in the church, to the body of Christ, I need you to look at me for a moment here. In order to align our opinions with God's word, we must be truthful and speak that truth in love. Our intent is not to divide or break fellowship on points of disagreement, but it needs to be addressed here. I highly respect your opinion and I hope you offer me the same courtesy. We can agree to disagree, amen? In an attempt to make sense of all the evil and the injustice in our world, some have taken scripture out of context and adopted a skewed understanding of suffering and sovereignty, power and authority, and ultimately of God's very nature. There's erroneous notion among Christians today that I believe could not be farther from the truth. It centers around two words. The first, omniscience. That because God knows everything, knows what's going to occur in the future that he caused it. These people are not able to separate causality from foreknowledge. Nor do they separate the idea that whatever happens or is allowed to occur on the earth is by God's design and must be his will. They presume his lack of intervention that's, it's allowed to happen, means his approbation, his consent, his approval, his endorsement, his will. Though the Lord is omnipotent, all-powerful, the El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty, he sovereignly chose to limit some of that power and authority and gave it to man. The fact that he relinquished a portion of his control to man does not make God any weaker. In his love, he made himself vulnerable, to our choices, we can resist God. Stephen, in the book of Acts, told those who were stoning him, you always resist the Holy Ghost. You can resist God. The other word is predestination, which has been taken to a hyper state. This doctrine goes as far as to say that God has preordained every action that has occurred in the world, good and bad, and we just need to accept it what grade school you attended, what injuries you have, who your neighbors would be, what outfit you're wearing this morning, what person you marry. All the events surrounding your life are all pre-scripted, all pre-ordained. If this were true, why are we admonished to pray without ceasing? Jesus told his disciples to pray this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why command us to pray thy will be done if his will is already done? Why empower us with the indwelling Holy Spirit to pray if his will is already predetermined? Why do we need to press on, to put to death, to continue in the faith, resist the devil, if God's sovereignty is total? This doctrine also suggests that his rule is so sovereign, so complete, that he's already pre-selected a vast majority of people for hell and a small minority for heaven. But a greater weight of scriptural evidence would say differently. Ezekiel 33, 
As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. John 1, Jesus is the true light that gives light to every man, not just the elect. 2 Peter 3, the Lord is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 12, and if I be lifted up from earth, I will draw all men unto me. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that whosoever believes would have eternal life. And second, or 1 Timothy 2, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The answer, so what's the bottom line here? The answer is surprisingly simple. So simple that I'm, I'm kind of baffled that I haven't seen a decade sooner. So what I've been explaining to you in the last 45 minutes here, only now I'm going to put it in a nutshell. Number one, God is good. And number two, he made man free. That's it. God is good. God is holy. He's just and good. There's no darkness or wickedness in him. He lives in unapproachable light and cannot sin nor tempt anyone to sin. Habakkuk, your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. The boastful shall not stand before you. You hate all evildoers. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked. God is good. Sin is the opposite of God. He will not be an accomplice to any of it. In him there is no darkness of all, at all. But if we don't grasp this second part, we will endlessly question why when the unexplainable and the, and the unexpected and tragedies occur and fail to see God. God made man free, Galatians 5. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but don't use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Joshua 24, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Deuteronomy 30, I've set before you life and death, blessing, cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. God made all of mankind free, free to do good or evil, free to make choices. Mao Zedong, the greatest mass murderer of our time, killed 55 million of his own people. Stalin followed with 35 million. Hitler starved, tortured, killed 20 million, 6 million of those Jews. And before we point the finger, look around you. 20% of the people that should be here are not here. Because the free will choices of lawmakers legalizing abortion have exterminated 63 and a half million babies since 1973. There's only 40 million in the state of uh, California. A recent post this week nailed it. Imagine being upset that babies will live. Whether you like our past president or not, him putting three conservative justices on the Supreme Court could very well reduce those atrocities by putting decision back in the state's control. All because of one man's choice, Lord, may it be so, amen. For God to be angry with the wicked every day and hate evil and yet have any controlling part in their wickedness is a monstrous allegation. Ezekiel 18, for I take no pleasure in the death of anyone declares the sovereign Lord, repent and live. Did God orchestrate these and the many other atrocities that we see and hear of? Emphatically, no. Again, a slanderous accusation. Matthew 17, enter through the narrow gate. Wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only a few find it. There's a difference between many and few. If God desires all men to be saved and only a few men are saved, it's, obviously, it's obvious that God's not yet in total control of everything. And our false view of sovereignty needs adjusted. Jesus' response to the events in Luke 13 reveals there are consequences to man's free choice, period. If you're not free, 
to do me wrong, are you free? No. If I'm not free to be wronged by you, am I free? No. Mark Lowry, a singer with the Gaither vocal band and comedian there, on his uh, first uh, outing with his uh, quartet that he was a part of when he was very young, uh, where they were in a head-on collision. And everybody had broken bones in this accident, and the driver of the uh, van was in a coma for three months. And Mark asked uh, God, why did this happen with all of us committed Christians and loving the Lord, and our desire was to just to serve you? And I'll never forget his answer because I, at that time, I wasn't quite grasping what I'm sharing with you today. He said, after 11 years, God gave him his answer. You know what it was? The driver fell asleep. Not some kind of a spiritual, big spiritual thing you got to connect it to. It. Somebody made a choice, and that choice caused a head-on collision and an accident. I know that cancer is the consequences of the curse, consequence of the curse, and why my 38-year-old son-in-law passed away six months ago from a brain tumor, leaving a young wife and four children. But I know that God didn't put it there. My wife went through seven grueling years of stage four breast cancer before passing away 10 and a half years ago now. She had... Uh, at least 10 different chemo regimes, infusions, uh, experimental drugs. She had four different operations, uh, mastectomies, and, and a number of other things, uh, radiations to three areas of her body, and uh, went through a lot of pain. And I remember maybe three or four years into, into this whole ordeal, we were, it was in the summertime, we were lying in bed, and I just about ready to fall asleep and I heard her crying, and she reached over and grabbed my hand. And she says, I need you to forgive me. Will you forgive me? Honey, what, what? I'm just kind of dazed. What do you mean, forgive you? I want you to forgive me for putting you and the family through this and not taking those, not getting those early mammograms like I should have. She uh, nursed all of her, our kids, and there was no cancer in the family, and she thought, well, that was, that was it, and the first mammogram she had it was very painful. She says, uh, I'm not doing it. But that night, she asked me to forgive her. She made a choice. I'm pretty sure that she'd still be alive today had she caught that disease in an early stage. We have choice. You are the product of your choices sitting here today. Understanding that God is good and that he made man free should help you in all areas, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and biblically. Balance out many of the questions life may hand you. The parameters of the curse need to make us aware of how far-reaching sin is in the human family even to the degrees mentioned earlier. A correct biblical perspective of suffering and sovereignty may help soothe the why questions of life. It will unite us in greater intimacy with our Savior's suffering, and it will enhance our hope for his soon coming return. I close with this final statement. God is so wise and powerful, he can orchestrate his divine purpose and will his sovereignty, while allowing for the laws of physics, Satan's evil influence, and the sinful free will choices of every human being on this planet to still occur and in the end accomplish his ultimate plan. My intent today was to present you truth so that you could, it could make you more free. Let's pray. Father, give each of us today clear perspective 
so that we can see suffering and sovereignty from our Lord's vantage point. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing uh, something beautiful, something good. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion he understood. I had to offer him was broken and strife but he made something beautiful of my